What a pleasure. It's, it's really nice to be here uh, for this event and uh, really exciting to be able to share with you more ideas on what has been a continual learning process in how we can continue to be more effective at talking to the public about science. Uh, it was almost appropriate that the setup here um, by Mr. Singh was the idea that there are so many good technologies that are poised to make a significant difference. In some places they are, other places they're not. You think about the fall army worm question, um, other issues about where we may see um, where we may see more opportunities to apply good technology that are not taken simply because people don't understand what the technology is. And there's an incredible amount of fear that's developed around them that impedes its application. What this is why this idea of science communication is not, and this is what was really hard for me to believe as a scientist, it's not so much about science. It's a lot less science and a whole lot of psychology. And what's been fun over the really 15 years I've been working in science communication at the public forefront has been that it's really been understanding the Rubik's Cube of how people think and behave and how we can better understand that to be more effective in our communication strategies. Now, Dr. Borlaug, um, whether he knew it or not, was an effective communicator because he had the trust of the people he was serving frequently in most of the places where he was working. Many of the sites in India, Pakistan, Mexico, were places where his ideas weren't necessarily originally greeted with warm reception. And eventually, by making good personal connections and by earning the trust of the people he was serving, could his application of his technologies flow. So what I would like to talk about today is really that psychology and would like to talk to you more, not, so not a lot of science, but a whole lot of the ideas of how we have to think about science and think about commun uh, the communications practice in order to make the science flow well. The first thing I'd like to start out with were two very important events that happened inside the last week, one of them right here in DC. There was the Science March. And at the same time last week, Netflix pioneered a new series um, by Bill Nye called new Bill Nye Saves the World. And what I would like you to think about is were these strategies for communicating science really effective? And did they help us as a scientific body gain public um, acceptance or trust from the public? Let's say it that way. Did they really help us win trust? And we'll come back to this at the end. And what I would like to show you is the ways that I'm thinking about these events, but the way that we put these into the larger context of what we've learned about science communication. And then revisit, are these the ways that we really will change the world? So back when Dr. Borlaug was doing his, his thing, um, science communication was a little bit different. You had an expert. And it wasn't just science communication, it was the TV nightly news. It was a physician speaking to a patient about an important uh, topic in medicine. These networks were very short. Maybe you learned something from a physician that you shared with your family or shared with a friend. Maybe you heard something on the news that you shared with a couple of colleagues. In this way, the uh, flow of information was quite finite. It was a couple of nodes. Information tended to start with experts and move down a couple of, of, of notches. If you contrast that about against what we see today. Communication is quite different. And that very simple flow from one node to another looks something like this. And that's an actual diagram of an internet-based conversation. And each one of those dots is an individual, and each one of those lines is the communication between them. And scientists and, uh, and, scientists and, um, and farmers, other folks in the agricultural industries, We've tended to be those little nodes over on the left-hand side, those two dots that are connected to each other. We're very good at talking to each other. We have a great language that we share. We're able to speak to each other and we, in, in, the, in the parlance of science. And we like it that way. We like talking about fi figures and facts and numbers and error bars and those kinds of things. That's where we're happy to go up with that same thing. Really what we want to do as scientists and as folks as science or farmers, folks in the agricultural industries, is we want to position ourselves as one of those nodes with many branches. And that this is how we have to be thinking about our new roles as science communicators that are going to facilitate the flow of new technologies. We have to be able to be those important central nodes with lots of spokes. 
I think this is, um, and, and there's a couple of good, important uh, rules if we're going to do that correctly. One of the biggest problems is that, and this is, was amazing to me, that I would ever have a problem as a public scientist for 30 years. <laughs> I, I walked into the lab 30 years ago and said, what do, where do I start washing dishes so I can start doing this? Um, I did that and uh, was fortunate to get those opportunities. But for 30 years later, the fact that I could talk to somebody about science and they would be skeptical about why I, what my motivation was. Why is he talking to us about science and technology? Who's paying him to give us this information? You know, the public is really concerned about uh, where their information is coming from in some cases. And in some cases, it's really kind of disappointing that somebody who has worked his entire life in these areas really doesn't carry as much weight as somebody who may have a more, um, a, a less than a, um, stellar record in terms of providing factual information. Yet, some people are trusted much more than others. And that's the magical word is trust. How do we gain the trust? How do we become the ones that are turned to for information when people aren't seeking it? And the most important part is that word of trust. Facts do not matter until you've established trust. And this is a phrase that when I say this gives goosebumps to my colleagues. Because we're in science and you know, facts are what matter. That's our currency. We speak to each other in facts. We publish them, right? Factual information, experimentally derived, um, doesn't matter. You will never change the mind of somebody who's concerned about their food and concerned about their family by talking about the statistics, talking about the facts. And that was a really tough lesson for me to learn because I wanted to participate in, in sharing what we knew about agriculture and food and the exciting time that we live in with the solutions that were coming that could feed more people better quality food and allow for less impact in the environment. I mean, to me, this is a great time. How do we become trusted? The problem is, is that it's permeated all of our society, whether it's our media, our government, universities, companies. There's many examples where we haven't exactly done the, where either there has been a lack of trust that comes from a lack of transparency or actually from direct indiscretions. A lot of erosion of the trust that we see come from a very finite set of um, opportunity, or an oppor a very finite set of events that resonated very strongly with the public. Even today, when you talk about science and you share what you know about science, someone says, "Yeah, but they said the same thing about cigarettes," you know, or or the same thing about thalidomide. You know, they always can pull out a 50-year-old. How do we develop that? And that's what I'd really like to spend the rest of my time talking with you about today. And I mentioned this last night, and it was a, a, a line on a final exam with one of my colleagues received. She's a journalism professor, professor that I adore, and she's, uh, she does beautiful work and really in teaching people how to speak about science. And, and I, I get a lot of training and ideas from her. But a student wrote on the exam, we will not change the world by giving people more information. We will change the world by, cha we'll change the world by changing how people feel. And the student, Hit the nail on them. Hit the nail on the head. That this isn't about burying people in numbers and facts and information. That until we've established a conduit of trust, a conduit um, that's emotionally connecting, and a conduit that allows us to kind of prime that audience to receive the facts. The facts just don't matter. They never will. This is about changing the way people feel. People are emotional and irrational. And if we're going to try to reach them as scientists, we need to be working on their level, not by being emotional and irrational, but by understanding how we can appeal to them. And that's what we'll talk about today, by examining really three different books. Thinking Fast and Slow is a book by economist Dan Kahneman. And uh, it's a wonderful book that discusses the human brain and the way that we think either fast and slow or, or what he calls system one and system two. The reptile brain that causes us to respond quickly to, to a situation, or if I tell you two plus two, you got four, you know, real quick. We have this other very slow processing brain that looks at information very carefully, that examines a situation. That if I told you 2,414 times 314, that's going to take that level two. It's going to take you a little time, maybe a calculator to get through. Kahneman talks about these two ideas of a fast brain and a slow brain, a fast reacting brain and a slow analytical brain and how 
scientists are trying to appeal to the slow and analytical brain why those who tend to sell the science a little short can appear appeal to that reptilian sense of fear, that immediate response, that quick response. And and that's where we'll talk about that in the in this in the context of Kahneman's book. The other book is Never Split the Difference, which comes to us from law enforcement. A former FBI hostage negotiator um, wrote this book and I'll talk about how we can apply this to science communication. And finally, the book by Jay Bayer that comes from the world of customer service. Jay Bayer is an expert in understanding customer service in the age of the internet and provides some excellent guidance that I'll share with you that I, I think apply very well to science communication. So the first thing we need to really put, in, put, put out there is who are we talking about when we're talking about the people we need to communicate to. And there's really three different groups. There's a group of people that are very well informed, that know where to seek good information and, and seek it out and, and integrate it and understand and use it to make their buying decisions. There's another set that the sky is falling. Very, very small group of people, but very vocal. Experts in using social media. Uh, people who are able to really cause quite a stir about food and farming, even though they don't know much about food and farming. Then there's this group, the majority of the pie doesn't know who to trust. And the most important phrase I got from one of uh, people in communication at my university is, is that people are seeking change, are seeking information. They don't know who to trust to get it. We have to be those trusted sources. So people looking for information, this is pretty good. Now this is a good thing for us. And a lot of people say, well, gosh, I wish we didn't have to deal with the consumer. No, this is a golden opportunity for us to tell the consumer how good we are. What are our motivations? Why are we so excited about the technologies that we have and the opportunities we have? We've never bothered to share that before. In fact, a lot of, most of the, you know, especially those of you who work in the company said, no, this is our black box, we're going home. You'll love it, don't worry about it, right? This wasn't the way to build trust with consumers. So, consumers are seeking information, they don't know who to trust. And this is really where we have to step in and show them what we bring to the table to be trusted. And that's where Kahneman's book really applies. Is that, whereas, many, whereas we have been trying to appeal, as science communicators, to the analytical part of the brain, without, um, we're, we're fighting against that fast reptilian brain that others can exploit. And we haven't been effective at doing this. We'll talk about how to do that. We know that people are more and more interested in food and farming. We know that um, they have great access to horrible information, which is really important. Um, they're asking more questions and that the media has been stoking those concerns. We also know that people's habits, that they're seeking information that confirms what they already believe. And that it's something that all of us do um, you know, there's two basic news networks, right? Because people are tending to follow the information that really confirms their own biases and fits with what they believe. Now, scientists, on the other hand, we tend to look for the information that challenges our beliefs. And I think many of you feel that same way. You like to see more good information, and it's more of a it's more of a um, more of a job of finding out what the good information is. And you know, that's always kind of the challenge. So th these are the major problems that we're up against. And those same people who are looking for good information, they're trying to figure out where to get it, um, they're up against a lot of messages of fear. And you can see those fearful messages, and you even see them uh, implicitly posted on things like on, on, a, on a chicken where it will say uh, no hormones, right? No hormones have been used in poultry in years, yet those kinds of claims are being used to separate that, that product in a marketing strategy. Same with other issues like Chipotle burritos. They'll say no GMO. The idea being to imply that other foods are inferior. Uh, and perhaps that things that are not labeled no GMO carry an, in, an, an inherent danger. So they use these tools of fear, appealing to Kahneman's system one, right? That rapid reptile brain. To the other side, we come with facts. And here we are as scientists and folks associated with agriculture, uh, farmers and others, who say, here are the facts, don't worry about it, everything's fine. And you can see why this doesn't work. You've got people worried about their health, about their families. You know, when you're having a battle between the heart and the head, the heart always wins. As science communicators, we never really got that. 
We always were thinking if we just kept giving more information, right? The deficit model. Fill their coconuts with information and everything will be fine. That's the way we used to do it. Turns out we weren't making much change. To make matters worse, there's a lot of very active campaigns to erode trust. And you can see that where we make our gains of, of winning trust, there's someone taking it away. Last year when it was announced that I was the Borlaug winner in 2016, the internet erupted with, well, just another corporate lackey, uh, you know, just another person paid off to lie about science. I mean, this is, there's an active campaign afoot. There are people whose job it is to follow me around the internet every single day and anything I post, make sure that they put some sort of defamatory statement that raises a question, plants that seed of doubt to make my message less credible. And this is the times that we're in, and there's ways that we respond to that effectively, and that's a topic for another year. But I think that it's important for us to remember that this idea of winning trust is coming with this active force that erodes trust. And of course, there's lots of information out there that really isn't very good that's also tainting the public's perception of science and scientists. So how do we do this? If we have, uh, a, if we're trying to move this needle of uh, facts and information, classically, other folks are bringing on fear. And so how do we do this? How are we able to move innovation to application? We've got lots of great solutions to problems that exist. How do we get them to happen? And in a way, this is really good news, what I'm about to tell you. It's actually a lot more simple than we thought. It just takes more of us communicating. And communicating effectively. This is something that, that we can solve by just providing the information in ways that people want to hear. Or better yet, speaking to people in ways that they want to listen to. It wasn't grammatically correct, but you get the idea. Um, speaking to people in a way that they, want it, that they want to hear it. Giving that good information. And so what is this trust conduit? What is this pipeline that we need to establish? And you can do it with a couple of, couple of important points. It's knowing your audience, using empathy, talking about values, evidence, and transparency. So we'll go through a couple of these rather quickly. So it's remembering that audience, right? We're not dealing with the people on the fringe who I spent years with. How many years I went back and forth with people who were either just, just against any kind of biotechnology or against, against um, maybe not even the science, just hate companies or whatever. And just trying to talk to them about what the science is and the science isn't and couldn't make any traction with them. I wasted a huge amount of time. I need to be talking to her, the person who's just curious about her food and her family, the pe person who just has concerns. She's the one I need to be speaking to. And that's really the point of this slide too. You don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the fringe. You're not going to change the guy in the Ronald McDonald suit with the meat cleaver about his, or her, or maybe her, uh, position on what she's out marching against. How do we change this topic? And it's about earning trust, and it's talking to the people who are just looking for answers. The other thing I'll talk about comes from law enforcement. And here's somebody who's in a really bad situation. And years ago, this kind of law enforcement situation would um, ha look very different. They would, the law enforcement would get together behind the parapet of that building and they would say, okay, you grab her left arm, I'll grab her right arm, and then we'll deploy a trampoline underneath and maybe it'll work out okay. Most of the time it didn't. <laughs> where you have to approach people who are in crisis situations or situations where they, they feel like something is really wrong, as many people who are against biotechnology do in their hearts, they feel that this is something wrong with the technology. We have to borrow from law enforcement and changing the way we approach them. And this was really the topic of the book by Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. We have to start with empathy. Understand why people feel the way they do. And this is something, again, scientists we're not good at, but, we, but we're getting better. Um, where did you find that information about golden rice that makes you so angry about it? Where did you read this information? Well, And then making sure that they understand that you understand where they're coming from. And one great trick in this, in this area is intellectual charity. Actually helping people build their arguments against you. So in other words, saying, well, I, I guess I've read things about that too, that maybe, there, maybe it wasn't uh, varieties that were culturally acceptable and that people weren't really excited about them. You know, help them build the argument against you so that they know that you understand. And when you show this kind of empathy, that builds so much trust with you as an authority um, and the information that will follow. It's really important. 
The other part about this is leading with our ethics, and that's Aristotle. Um, Aristotle taught us that good persuasion was based upon three very different uh, um, entities, three very different components, that they involved ethos, pathos, and logos. And to go through this uh, rather quickly, pathos is this idea of emotion. Okay? Sympathy, empathy, all those are in that pathos area. Um, logos is where scientists come from. We come from logic, words, you know, like logos meaning word. Um, we were putting together logic in, in ways that, that we understand. That's our language, right? We're the, we're the ones of logos. But you can see that in our interface with the public, when pathos, the heart, against the logos of the head, that's a losing battle for us. We can't bury people in information to get out of this. We can't teach our way out of it, you know, like many people believe. Just give them more information, they'll be fine. Doesn't work. In order for us to be able to make progress here, we have to go with ethos. And as scientists, and folks in science-related areas and ag-related areas, we have an awful lot of ethos. Ethos is ethics. Why we do what we do. Why we chose the jobs we chose. Why we do what we do every day. What are our values, our goals, our long-term ambitions. Our, our background, our credibility, our training. These are the things that give the speaker more credibility. These are, this is, this is why the Borlaug recognition was such a great platform for me. It was another wonderful credential that allowed me to, that said his peers recognize him as an expert. Something that I, that I, that's very important to me. So when we talk about the ethos, how do we do this? We lead with our values. We talk about our priorities. We talk about the, our concerns. And why am I a scientist? Well, I knew very on that, very early on, that I wanted to change the planet and I wanted to change things for people. And I wanted to use technology to get there. And so when I talk about we, farmers and having sustainable farming that, that keeps farmers profitable, the 1% that feeds us, you know, that, that they have what the resources they need in terms of genetics and production techniques in order to keep them competitive. Um, something for the industrialized world consumer so that people here who have such access to abundance can have access to better food and maybe make better food choices. We want something for the needy, the people who still live in, in incredible poverty around the world, that they would have access to our genetics and production techniques. And then, of course, doing all of this with environmental sustainability and sensitivity to the environment. <laughs> when I talk to people about my priorities, um, and when we have a discussion about genetic engineering or climate or whatever, it's very easy for them to realize that I'm on their side. That, you know, we, that we align on everything. We're, 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 we're standing up for the same important core values. I just know a few tools that help us get there in a different way. And you can see how that builds the trust. I understand why they feel the way they do. I talk to them about why I feel the way I do. And just that kind of a back and forth establishes that trust conduit. It opens a channel by now information can flow. The old way we used to do this, engage the deniers. Here are the facts, here's where you're wrong, and you don't get it, you idiot. Right? And that, that was me. It's many of my colleagues, um, even still today. What we need to do is engage those curious people in the middle of the curve, the people who are just concerned about their food and their families. And understand why they feel the way they do, and then talk about your values, and why being a scientist, why being someone who's associated with agriculture, why it's important to you why it's important to you, and, and that, that brings you together. It really does have a unifying ability to bring people of very different opinions together, at least if you can align on values and then share the ideas of how you can get to the next level. And that's the big problem, is that facts just don't matter until you've established that trust. And that there's a lot of important ways that we can uh, use these techniques to develop trust with the people we need to influence. I think that's, uh, and, and this is becoming more and more a uh, theme among people who are, have been studying how to reach public audiences. Lots of surveys, uh, like the Center for Food Integrity, does mountains of surveys that come to the same conclusion. Uh, I've learned this from boots on the ground. You know, I, 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 was, I was taught how to be a scientist, but I learned how to be a communicator. You know, it's been total boots on the ground, baptism by fire, in learning to get to the same place that many have uh, found th through uh, theoretical analysis. Um, of course, there's ways to erode trust. We don't need to go into that too much. But I'd like to go into more about what evidence you do use. And when we talk about evidence, 
you finally get to the point where we can start sharing facts. But use facts that reinforce your values. And I think this is really important. Um, that when we go to talk about biotechnology, it doesn't really get people excited to talk about Roundup Ready corn and uh, BT and rootworms and things like that. People don't get it and they don't understand how agriculture works and going to examples that really benefit <laughs> farmers doesn't, doesn't really resonate with them. You have to go to ideas that really bolster your values and represent your values. Talk about biofortification, about decreasing allergies in the industrialized world. Maybe helping find plants that can survive temperature extremes. And finding examples like the papaya of where biotechnology can fortify plants and protect them against um, the pathogens that challenge production. In Florida, we're, we're getting it horribly in citrus. And I wish we had a biotech solution that we could deploy today um, or five years ago. A couple of great examples are the eggplant or the brinjal in, uh, in Bangladesh. The deployment of this particular technology has allowed the farmers that grow it to go from uh, 80 sprays a year down to two. And it's two because there's pests that aren't necessarily feeding on the eggplant that are susceptible to the BT. So things like white flies, other pests that, mm -hmm. that are unaffected by BT. I have a little icon in the corner for my podcast. I do a podcast every week. And the examples that we talk about with the uh, scientists that have deployed them or others uh, who are affected by them uh, are wonderful stories that I hope you will listen to and, and enjoy and maybe pass along to others because when you hear the people talk about standing in that field and seeing the uh, eggplants that are grown without the BT and those that are grown with and the difference in application of pesticide, those are really compelling stories. The same thing true with uh, the recent breakthroughs in suppressing aflatoxins, which destroy 160 tons of, of corn a year and affect 4.5 billion people. And it's one of the most deadly toxins in terms of liver cancer and other issues. And there are technologies now that could be used to suppress it with no effect on the corn itself, but affecting the fungal toxin. Uh, another one that really is great to get familiar with and also is in the podcast series. So the last uh, thing I really will talk about is some of the ways we can be more effective in responding to critics. And this is where we come to the, the, the work from Jay Bayer. And if you can read this book, you'll love it. He's a customer service person. He's from a customer service background. Yet what he can teach us as scientists and others as to how to, ex how to talk to the public is amazing. How do we hug our haters? Yeah, I got a, quite a few of them, but I hug a lot. And this kind of advice has been the best because the bottom line is, is that if we're participating in a public discussion together here, pub, out, in, out on the street or on the internet, it is now a spectator sport. This kind of discussion is a spectator sport. And when you make a comment in the uh, section of the news article in the New York Times that says, well, the author kind of got this wrong, here are some things I know about. Um, for every one person who's writing, there are a hundred who are reading. And so we have to be remembering our audience, right? We're not, if someone writes there, well, everything that they say is lies, the uh, technology's a failure, it never works. For me to go on and say, you know, well, you're totally wrong, the technology works great, and it doesn't, doesn't move the needle. We have to go back to what we learned about empathy and values, and then speaking from our values and using our, our ethos. It looks like this. Um, and this example comes from a restaurant, not from science but comes from Yelp, a taste of Venice restaurant. The food was awful, it was the service horrible. If you think this is Italian food, go home and open a jar of Prego, you'll be happier. Uh, this might be the taste of Venice if you drink the canal water, I'll never eat there again. Now, this is a complaint from a customer, and the chef gets online and says, well, obviously you don't know anything about Italian food, my family's restaurant, hope you never return. We don't need people like you here. <laughs> now this is where, this is, this is an actual example I put together after reading uh, Bayer's book. But you can see, do you trust Chef Mario? And would you want to go to that restaurant? He's probably right. You know, this other first guy is kind of a jerk. You know, he may not, you know, he, he didn't have to leave such a nasty review. But obviously, Chef Mario doesn't make it any better. What if Chef Mario took the approach that we're taking in science communication? and said, I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Meals are, should be special times with the family, and I understand why you're disappointed. My family has, so there's your empathy, right? There's the empathy component. 
My family has run this business for 15 years, and customer satisfaction is our first priority. There's the, uh, the ethos, right? There's the values, our family, um, our, our values about why we do this. We'd love to try again. So come in, ask for me, dinner's on me. I'm sorry you're disappointed. We want to get it right. That is the best advertisement this guy could have ever gotten. Responding correctly to an angry consumer. Much better than the ad you put in the paper, much better than the website, and much better than the billboard. Here he got a complaint and he responded to the complaint in a very um, sensitive and values-based way. Anybody who reads that review is now on, on his side. So in the restaurant of science, right, how do we be better Chef Mario's? And how do we respond to our critics in ways that are soft and productive? You know, talking about values, talking about what's important to us. That's the way we earn their trust. And that's really where we have to go. Another way to do this is to get out of your echo chamber and look for opportunities to talk about science with the people we never talk to. Um, way back in the beginning, I showed you how we're very good at talking to each other, but not to others. I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to write for Cook's Cook. It's an internet magazine targeted at foodies with a million readers. They get a million readers in this thing. And I get to write to them about areas of science and agriculture. And I write about new tasty tomatoes. I talk about blueberries and mechanical harvesting to solve problems with labor shortages. This month, it's on clams and how they filter water and make better aquatic environments. But then I get to, once in a while, put something in about technology. I've earned their trust as an expert in food and science, and now can put in more information that they may not be exposed to in a context that they're very comfortable with. So getting out of our echo chambers and exploiting those other opportunities are great ways to build those trust conduits. So with everything we just talked about, if we go back and apply that type of analysis to this March for Science and Bill Nye Saves the World, we have to wonder if these are really the most productive ways that we can uh, participate in getting the public on board with us and standing up for science. You know, and nobody ever changed their mind because we said, what do we want? Public trust. When do we want it? Now. You know, <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't work that way. Um, it, that I hope that the scientists who are inside these efforts now find themselves equally compelled to join classrooms, to write articles online, to provide information for retirement homes, to help get into the communities to earn the trust, not just march with a sign. Instead of writing something on a pizza box, sitting down with the pizza and talking to someone who doesn't share your views, but does share your values. That's the way we create the change. Nye's recent um, series spends a lot of time preaching to the choir and really taking jabs at people who disagree. And unfortunately, it alienates the people in the middle of the curve, and it really turns off people who could be good allies in standing up for science. And I think as you watch that, really think about it in the context of empathy and values and see that maybe we could have done a little bit better in this case with using such a great media opportunity to produce something that would have been much more amenable to creating uh, a much larger groundswell in support of science rather than pushing back against people who uh, aren't necessarily fans of, of technology. So, and that's really the big deal. Do, do we protest people into caring, and is this a way to earn trust? And do we alienate those that we need to influence when we're condescending about their concerns? And I, I wrote something on Medium about this, and I, I hope that you read it. It really is an important analysis that this great opportunity to reach people really was kind of squandered and really will backfire ultimately, I'm, I'm afraid. So to conclude, effective communication really requires this conduit of trust and that we have to recognize that people in their hearts believe that there's something wrong with food and farming and that there's something that, that, that we have, and, and they're concerned, they're interested, and they're an opportunity for us to talk to them. And it's important for us to share that human story, share our values, what's important to us, why do we get out of bed and do this? You know, what is it, what's, good, why, what's good in this for us? Why do we get excited about participating in the future of food? Engage constructively using values-based messages and respond to critics in ways with a hug much more than, than a, you know, um, taking care to really uh, um, answer questions about agriculture with grace. Um, and get out of your echo chamber when you can. Find those opportunities. The internet is begging for content from experts. You are all experts. You can go out there and write about this stuff. Find venues for it. It can be done. 
Because at the end of the day, she's the one we need to reach. Go talk to her. I will stop there. I don't know if we would do questions, but thank you very much for your time and attention, and you can always find me at any of these areas, any of these uh, um, addresses. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for listening. I think we have No, I'd love to take questions. If there's anybody, we've got about five minutes for, for a question. Yeah, if it was up to me, I'd take the questions the whole time. <laughs> yeah, do you need us to go to the mic? Or? Yes, if you could, yeah. Hi, wonderful presentation. This is Wendy Fink with the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And my question for you is, you mentioned some of the folks out there that are actually paid to essentially undermine your message. Um, of course, that is a problem that we find in many fields of science, um, and particularly the climate science side of things. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's a little different than hugging your hater. That's not an emotional Right. There. No, I, I love this question because this is exactly, I used to handle this totally wrong. And a year and a half ago, when I was under fire, I would get defensive and I would um, push back in what were rather negative and potentially nasty ways that didn't make me look very good, kind of the hug your haters idea. What happens now is that the difference between then and now isn't necessarily scientists stepping into the conversation. It's getting better. And it isn't necessarily agriculture farmers doing this. It is getting better. We have ignited the science nerds, right? We have turned on the science enthusiasts with this message of the great things we can do with technology, yet um, aren't doing. And they are the ones who are really picking up and carrying the water here, and they're doing a great job. So nowadays, when someone says something about me or digs, you know, misrepresents the science, and I say about me because they do it about me all the time, I always use the copy function, and I paste their comment, and I paste about the facts right above it, you know, but from a values-based uh, discussion. So in other words, and I guess I always I put me on uh, as an example, where someone will say, well, you know, you did this, 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 and this. And I'll say, yes, but my record, I'm really a, a huge fan of transparency. It's extremely important to me. Every, my record of financing can be seen here, and I provide a link to the website. So what that does is it speaks to the middle. They see someone making an accusation against a public scientist. They see the scientist saying, well, transparency is something I really honor and respect and it's important. Here's where you find out about it. And now I've won everybody in the center of that curve. The blue piece of that pie sees me as the good guy. So that's the way we have to be doing this in those opportunities. Any other questions? Oh, here's a little couple. I'll go, you gotta run, you gotta run over to the microphone. I'll go fast. I'm Dan, Dan, I'm Dan Silverstein. Um, I'm a strategic advisor. You're talking about um, the average citizen who makes comments. So this this uh, uh, patron of the Italian diner was just somebody who lives in town. Mm -hmm. What do you think about uh, thought leaders or centers of influence who express basically the same sentence, not, not the Italian thing, but about yeah. GMOs. And I'm, uh, what brought this to mind is the other day I tore a page out of People Magazine, which was a, um, a feature, of, a full page picture of Jenna Elfman, who's a TV actress, and it was dotted all around with little comments about aspects of her life. And, and uh, among